Welcome to Mining Now, everyone. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Joining me is Gaudi Molina. Good morning, Gaudi. Good morning. Were, were you having a little bit of a panic today as I was, uh, you knew I was cycling in and waiting for me to show up? <laughs> <laughs> I was. I was like, is he going to be here on time? I don't know. <laughs> the semis were passing me in really slow traffic. I don't know what was wrong with me today. Um, we've got an exciting episode today. We've got the Bucket Shop. Um, they are out of Timmins, Ontario. Uh, I'll just give a quick read of what they do. Repairing and building new buckets for earth moving equipment. Um, they also build, uh, truck boxes for mining. They do a lot of stuff and they've expanded their service offerings. They've got a new product line we'll see that in the sponsors. We've got lots to cover. So, um, we've got their, we've got one of these double guest things, which I think people just love those. I yeah. noticed the watch time on them is, is a lot longer. I think just because of that sort of diversity and in, in approach and everything course, like that. Yeah. So we've got Paul Woodward. He's the vice president and Jamie Powell. He's the business operations lead. So lots of exciting stuff to cover. <clears throat> Who are our sponsors today? All righty. So today, first up, we've got Fenner Dunlop. Hardworking people need hardworking conveyor, be- conveyor belts to get the job done. Fenner Dunlop not only manufactures the toughest and longest lasting conveyor belts in the world, but manufactures all of their conveyor belting products in their own North American facilities. This ensures the integrity of Fenner Dunlop conveyor belting and allows them to monitor each step of the production process. Fenner Dunlop conveyor belts are engineered to withstand the harshest conditions and heaviest loads from the bulk coal, heavy metal, and precious metal mining industries. With with over 150 years under their, be- their belt, their globally recognized expert sales, services, and technical teams are available to ensure your belts last a lifetime. For more information, you can visit them at fun- FennerDunlopAmericas.com or you can call 1-800-661-2358. And you can also watch Fenner Dunlop's upcoming episode on Mining Now. Next up, we also have Savannah Equipment. Savannah Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from plaster to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. You can visit them at SavannahEquipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. And we also have RhinoWare. RhinoWare is solving industries wear challenges. This is the first evolution of wear products in a generation. RhinoWare products offer an aggressive line of wear products consisting of chrome white iron, chromium carbide overlay plates, ceramic compounds and surfacing polymers, custom cast solutions for LHD heel shrouds and lip systems, engineered lift devices, and much more. You can visit them at rhinowareproducts.ca to solve your challenges. And of course, we have a CIM 2021 convention and expo coming this May 3rd to 6th. Um, This is a virtual event. Uh, You can register at CIM.org. Get insight from industry leaders like Anglo-Americans, Mark Hutafani, Caterpillars, Denise Johnson, Torx Golds, Jody Kuzenko, and many more. Again, you can register today at CIM.org. CIM.org. They are also featuring, um, I believe, a. a, a, a oh, uh, what, is oh the, right. what are they doing? Yes, I, I, they're I, doing. A, they're doing. A, they gave a booth to Mining for Miracles. And oh. Mining for Miracles this year is raising, I want to get this right, <laughs> they're raising funds for the Cellular and Regressive uh, Medicine Center, which is in conjunction with the. BC uh, Children's Hospital and BC Children's uh, Foundation. Definitely, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So they CIM really stepped up. I mean, they've got a lot to do. We're trying to go virtual. So it was. uh, I thought it was a very uh, class act to show their support. So I just wanted to throw that in. Miningformiracles.ca to check that out. Okay. Okay. And is that the? Are that the? Is that the sponsorship for today? That is the sponsorship for today. Yeah. Okay. Well. uh, Welcome, welcome, Paul and Jamie. As you can see, the uh, the equipment companies uh, that uh, are kind of working around the industry here, and they were quick to sponsor your episode. So a lot of collaboration there. Fantastic, thank you. Great to hear. Um, okay, um, I gave a little intro on the show um, about who your company is. Probably didn't. There's a lot going on. You have, you know, you have government partnerships and indigenous partnerships um, with op- mine operators developing new product lines like you've got a lot going on so could you maybe uh and i maybe i'll let whoever wants to pick this up uh what's sort of that snapshot view of the bucket shop jamie would you like to uh, start us off today well i appreciate that so the vice president and owner of the company since 1991 has allowed me to speak on his behalf so i 
Thank you, Paul. Um, so the, the bucket shop operates in the mining sector in Northern Ontario. Uh, we repair a lot of heavy equipment products such as buckets and boxes, and we also built it from scratch. So we've helped uh, extend life cycles of mining equipment throughout Northern Ontario for, for many, many years. And it's something that we've developed our own brand, a product line as well to support wear systems. So uh, for underground mines and open pit mines, so firstly, Northern Ontario, but we've expanded to a global presence as well. We have tremendous results in, in our own product lines and when we're operating the, the hardest rock conditions in the world. So the results that we've proven in Northern Ontario have started to help us grow uh, globally and show that we can help mines prosper anywhere in the world. That's that's a big reason that I was excited to have you on the show today. And, and I'm glad both of you wanted to kind of look at sort of those brass tax projects, but also sort of the bigger picture. And I, I wanted to start off today because you've sort of, as a company, and I know this is for me, the outside looking in, but it seems like you've really hit sort of milestone after milestone. Um, you know, there's, and I, and I wanted to cover that, you know, the expansion of your facility, your cat, uh, your, your expanding your cast solution, things like that. Uh, maybe Jamie, maybe I'll stick with you for a minute. Can you talk about that sort of at a high level? Some of those, you know, those game changers that the company has uh, succeeded in, in achieving. Sure. Well, I would say the first game changer was if you go back to 1991, Paul was actually a co-op student for what was the bucket shop at the time. And, uh, he convinced his dad that this is a prospering business and a prospering sector. So it was his initiative at the time that even created the concept of the bucket shop. And, and that's where it started. Now, fast forward through a number of expansions and really the, the significant milestone. Again, this is Paul's initiative back in 2015. We launched our own line of cast wear products. And, and those are cast protective systems for the, the lip of an underground bucket and the heel shrouds. And we also complemented that with a two-piece bucket concept where uh, the whole front end could be unbolted underground instead of being cut off and sent to surface for repair. So that launched Bucket Shop to a global scale with these wear solutions that were competitive with anyone else in the world, not, not only for longevity, for, but for price and value as well. So the cast solutions in 2015 was an absolute game changer. A couple of years after that, the, the, the Woodward family had committed to Timmins and Northern Ontario through the development of the facility that we sit in now, a brand new research and, and production facility. We've now expanded that twice since. So two more game changers in the last four years to now have about 85,000 square feet to work with uh, and 15 acres to operate within. Uh, and we kept our old property as well. So from a game changing perspective, our, our story will evolve in the next uh throughout the rest of the interview, but th those are some of the key milestones that the family is committed to investing in Northern Ontario. Timmins has really pronounced itself as, as a hub of mining activity right now for what's happening uh, locally and, and globally. So uh, we're really proud to be part of that. It's uh, it's exciting to be, you know, we have a lot of American guests and actually guests from all over the world, but it's always fun when you see a company and a lot of the companies that come on our show from outside the country they're very, they're very aggressive com uh, companies. That's why they're coming on the show that, you know, they want to expand their market. And so it's exciting to have that same sort of energy coming from a Canadian company. Um, Paul, I want to jump over to you to sort of those cast solutions and, and to actually paint a picture. I mean, the people that watch the show, a lot of them, they love the, they love the nuts and bolts of it. So do you have a couple of examples um, of, of projects you've done, maybe some pictures that we can bring up that, that actually showcase the, you know, the tangible work that you've done? Well, for sure, Jared. Um, cast lips in particular is something that uh, the industry has been using for a number of years um, and there's been no real changes made to that particular design over a number of years. And uh, we took it upon ourselves to uh, take that existing technology back to the drawing board and make those products that customers are buying better. So we've taken, uh, you know, that standard uh, cast lip uh, design. We've made the product improvements. We've incorporated white iron uh, into those uh, solutions, which has uh, increased the life cycle and the uptime of these pieces of equipment, uh, which is something that's extremely important to the uh, to the end users. And we've taken that same technology and we've incorporated that into our heel designs as well, which is uh, something that's unique. It's something that's new to the industry. And it's uh, something that we're, we're quite proud of. Um, it's uh, now in its uh, seventh or eighth revision. Uh, continuous improvement uh, plays a very important role uh, within the organization as we determine ways to do things better and make product improvements. Uh, we continue to do that. And it is, uh, I feel it's our job to 
um, uh, remove costs from the customer's uh, uh, operation and, and improve life cycle at the same time. I, uh, you're, you're going to have to forgive some layman questions. I always tell people on the show, I, I'm not the expert. That's why you're on. Uh, what is white steel? Uh, white iron is a uh, bimetallic type product that uh, it, it comes in at about 700 Brunel. It's a specialty alloy and uh, it's a, a fused product on top of a mild steel base plate uh, that offers uh, really good wear characteristics and moderate uh, to uh, medium impact and high abrasion applications. So it is a, a very specific product and when used in the right applications, it offers a great return. Something I'm always curious about with innovation is, um, I mean, there's certain things that obviously that just weren't known before, but I'm always curious why, why it hasn't been done more prior, you know, because you are an innovative company. Why, why was it uh, your company? Do you think was, is it harder? Is it more expensive to manufacture? What sort of the, what was the holdback of, of using the methods that you use now? Well, I can't say for sure why industry was, uh, didn't come up with it before we, came up with our solutions, but it's uh, something that we need to be doing all the time is thinking outside the box um, as technology evolves and these products become available uh, to industry. Uh, how can we capitalize on taking uh, this new technology and incorporating it into the, uh, the things that we do in our day-to-day -day business? And uh, thus far, we've been very successful with this recipe. We're very proud of the solutions. And um, the field reporting and the audits and the feedback that we get from customers and um, the studies that we do on products that come into the shop allow us to further develop and enhance the product line, bringing further value and increase uptime. I, I might have missed it, Paul, but I wanted to ask you about steel tech. Is that part of what you just explained or is that something different? The steel tech is a separate division. Uh, we all operate under the same roof, but that is basically our boots on the ground division, uh, whereby we supply services to various mining operations uh, for shutdowns, uh, structural steel supply and installation, um, and uh, mobile welding rigs in the field, for example. So it's a very diverse uh, operation, but it is an arm and an extension of the bucket shop, and the two divisions complement themselves very nicely when going into the field. So when you developing these products, I think you said in its uh, seventh uh, reiteration or generation, um, when are you, are you collaborating directly with the buyers? Are you getting feedback and, and then adjusting on the fly? Like if you, if you give them one bucket, is the next bucket going to be different because of the feedback they give you? Or are you looking for, how does it sort of work that, that R and D because you're, you're such an operational company that there's, but there's this R and D component. So how do you approach that when you're actually selling directly to the mines? Well, we're always soliciting the mine for feedback. Number one, uh, number two, if we're going to introduce new technology to the field, it's very important that we be collecting that data. And uh, sometimes that's very difficult to obtain uh, today, just with the pace and, and, and what's happening in mines today. Um, but uh, we do provide services whereby we go underground and we provide audit support, uh, whereby we'll collect the, that data ourselves. And we put that into Excel spreadsheets and we share that information with the mines, uh, which allows them to uh, better understand understand um, the, the uptime within their own equipment, uh, where they are within the life cycle of that particular product. And it, it does provide a lot of assistance in them understanding where they are with the, their fleet and, and the status of their fleet for when it comes to maintenance. I, uh, you know, I do this show and an hour to, depending on who you are, it can seem like a long time, but there's so much that goes on. I would love to one day be, be a fly on the wall. So if you ever want to do a live show let me know i'm there um the the facility jamie uh you, you touched on that already but you know i don't want to just breeze by that because you really i mean it's been a huge upgrade i guess i want to start this part with how how much of a game changer was expanding that facility and what sort of what was the expansion itself Oh, thanks, Joe. That's a good question. So, so some of the significant stuff that Paul and Ross put the, the thought into this building was, if we were going to expand to a global level, what are the types of equipment and technology that we'd require in a facility to accommodate potential growth? And, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll highlight a couple components that are in the production environment. It all starts really with our, our CNC controlled plasma cutting table, which is a hundred feet long. Now to put that in perspective, 
uh, that, that, that allows us to possibly cut four separate sheets of steel at the same time. Almost every one of our projects starts with a great big flat piece of steel and some hardness and some thickness. And we cut it into the shape that we need from an engineer design. And then we form that sheet into whatever it is that we need to build. So that cutting table has been a game changer for us for productivity um, and at the number of projects that we can kickstart within the production environment. The second huge component that we have in here is after something gets cut and needs to be shaped or formed, we have an enormous brake press that can apply almost 800 tons of pressure. Now that would allow us to take a three inch thick plate of steel. And if we were to form that into the shape of a basket, as an example, we have that ability to do that. And again, it's all CNC controlled or engineered uh, documents. So uh, the human factor gets removed from the whole process. And in addition to that, we have over 30 individual welding cells, which are all bulk fed with their gases and electricity. So production capacity and efficiency is tremendous in the production environment. And I'd say the, the final piece of uh, the production environment that's really grand is we put nine different cranes in the whole environment. And we have one of them has a lifting capacity of 70 tons. And that was actually based on feedback from some of the large mines in the territory telling us how big some of their equipment is. Uh, and Paul in the design basically said, well, if we're going to handle some of that big equipment, we'll need a ton with the, the lifting capacity of at least 70 uh, crane, pardon me, with 70 tons to accommodate that. And we have lots of pictures of certain pieces of equipment that we needed every uh, muscle capacity of that crane just to get it off. Right. And so, um, so that's the primary production capacity. Now, the two new buildings that we've added since, I'll, I'll highlight one of our the recent ones that opened just a few months ago. In a single 10,000 square foot facility, we have three individual booths. And one of them is a special abrasive blasting booth. Now, in our environment, we typically would sandblast. Sandblasting is noisy. And once you're finished with sandblasting, everything on the ground is, is waste material. Well, we now have a dedicated booth with uses steel shot in a recycling capacity. So about 95% of the steel shot is recaptured in augers and magnets. It gets filtered and cleaned and really used in a closed loop. So we can continue to blast and blast and it's more environmentally friendly and it's far more efficient as well. In addition to that, we have two brand new paint booths with the capability to put a fire truck in there and paint it if needed. So, and that's just one of the facilities that we finished the completion of this year. So. When we look at total capacity from end to end, taking a product in as a raw plate of steel and completing it as a finished painted product, we can do it all in one uh, process on a single property here in Tim is now. The question I was going, you already touched on it, the cranes, uh, the cr getting that feedback from the, the actual operators, uh, knowing what you'd need for crane capacity. Paul, I want to jump over to you uh, for this is, and that that investment, but not just the financial investment, but the investment of time, mapping it all out, understanding what you actually need. Do you need four booth paint booths or do you need three? I mean, it's I I even though I haven't done it, I've done some things that have some similarity and it's a huge, huge undertaking. How did you approach that? Was it a lot of feedback? Was it just years of experience? I'm sure it was a combination of things, but what was that main driver that that sort of helped guide the decision process of what to invest in? Well, we'd been uh, in our old facility for a number of years, and uh, that was at approximately about a 35,000 square foot facility. And as Jamie said, today we're 85,000 square feet today on 15 acres. And uh, we're on our fourth move here today. Uh, we've continued to, uh, to evolve. We've continued to outgrow each expansion and each move along the way. Um, some unique things have happened within the Timmins environment over the last, uh, I'm going to say, five to 10 years. And the gear has gotten bigger. And in order to uh, capitalize on getting our hands uh, and our arms around that work and create those employment opportunities, it was important that we created the work environment necessary uh, in order to house and, in fact, work uh, on this larger gear. Um, everything from open pit shovels to some of the larger uh, uh, surface uh, haul trucks that exist within the region now, uh, up to 350 ton, uh, you know, haul capacity. These weldments weigh anywhere from, you know, 100 to 120,000 pounds, which makes the uh, the 70 ton crane an absolute necessity yeah. in order to be um, to be offering these services to the um, to the local mines. So the last thing we want to see is work leaving the territory 
And uh, in order to ensure that that didn't happen, um, you know, it was important that we invested here in Timmins. Uh, we're big believers in supporting local and and keeping the work here and, and creating an equal opportunity for uh, for employment uh, within the region. You know, you're you're touching on something um, though that I I'm a, just a huge huge believer in is you you know. I love staying local too, but it's, uh, <laughs> I won't name drop here, but a very, very successful businessman in Canada once gave me advice. He was nice enough to actually take a two minute phone call with me. And he said, it's very simple. Have a, a good mouse trap and a better product for a better price. That's it. And, and you are, are obviously promoting buying local, but you are a company that's investing in making sure you have that value. And, and again, and I just want to kind of circle back to that. Was that did was there a lot of feedback even beyond the cranes from the operators, or did that experience you brought in really just you did you was it hard to decide what to invest in, or was it pretty clear what was needed when it, when the time came? Well, I mean, uh, as a family, we had been committed to uh, moving out of the old facility and, and 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 doing something on a more grand scale for a number of years. And uh, unfortunately, the economy was not stable enough uh, at the time. And on three different occasions, uh, we were ready to go and, uh, and we decided to pull back. In uh, 2017, uh, we committed to moving forward, regardless of the state of the economy, which uh, at that point in time was not exactly stable either. Um, however, it turns out to have been a good move. Uh, we built at a time when uh, the economy wasn't the best, knowing that it was always going to rebound. The family's always had a great deal of faith in, in Timmins and in the economy in general, and being a gold-based uh, uh, producing uh, uh, community, uh, you know, gold never seems to lose its luster, and if it does, it's never for very long. So at two 2017, I think we were just climbing out of, you know, $700 an ounce gold. And, and today we're seeing, you know, much better figures. Um, and, and the exploration that's happening within the community and in the region, I don't think there's a drill rig that is parked right now that's not, uh, you know, putting uh, putting rod into the ground and uh, just a great deal of activity. So it turns out that our timing was absolutely perfect. We're well poised for the, uh, um, the next uh, round of works to come. We've got some big projects uh, happening locally uh, that are going to transform, uh, you know, our business and create a lot of opportunities for other local companies as well. Yeah, I, I bet. Did that did that expansion of that facility? Um, and if you have some examples, that would be great. I, I thought I was watching one of your um, like your corporate video, and I I swear I saw a ball mill in the facility. Did that expansion allow you to do a lot of of other custom work? Is that is that become part of your business, or was it always, but now it's expanded? Uh, it's definitely a new facet to our business and our offerings. The 70 ton crane allows us to do things that we could not have done at the old facility. And our largest crane at that time was a 20 ton capacity crane. So I think the component that you're uh, referring to, uh, Jared, was the primary, uh, uh, the shaft out of the primary crusher uh, for one of our major mines up here locally. And that happened to be a product that they were trying to uh, remove the component off of the shaft. And they'd been at it for four or five days and uh, trying to do it in the field when they finally decided decided to put it on a truck and uh, bring it here. We had the crane ability to lift it off the truck. And in less than 48 hours, we had the two parts apart uh, with the shaft being sent uh, into uh, into the States for rebuild, allowing the mine to, uh, to get back up and running. And uh, obviously the primary crusher is a very important piece uh, on, on every mining property. I, I know, I know it's Canadian to be humble, but um, it must feel pretty good when you walk out into that facility and see the capability that your company has now. I mean, that must be, and especially when it's a family company and you, you know you grow up with it. I mean, that must the feeling must be amazing. It is, and you know, we we all get caught up in our days, and and there's so much activity here at the uh, at, at the bucket shop. Uh, I still find myself walking out to, onto the shop floor, somewhat miffed by where we came from and where we were 10 and 15 years ago. And when I look back at 1991, when we were two people and today we're, you know, in excess of 140 at peak, at, at peak operating, it's, uh, it, it's impressive. And we're very, very proud uh, as a second generation uh, family member. It's, I can tell you that it's not been easy working for family. Uh, and, and there's so many, um, 
horror stories out there of, of some of the difficulties that different companies uh, or different families have been through. But we've got a very uh, unique environment here. We've uh, surrounded ourselves with the best people that we can find in the region and big believers in bringing family values into the workplace and surrounding yourself with the best. And the company can only be as good as the people that work for it. So um, uh, we're very proud of uh, who we are and where we come from and very humble beginnings as well. You know, I, uh, I have, when I, when I start the process of seeing if someone's going to come on and what's the best option for them and that, uh, sometimes it's, you know, the decision maker's not there. And, but with your company, I think there was maybe even four of you in the room and it was like, and I, I came to that meeting. I went, this company takes it seriously. <laughs> they like, and, and it, it says something about a company right away when they take, you just you can you can almost see the success just by the way that you you approach even even a small company like ours doing something with you. It's taken seriously. It's thought out. It's planned out, uh, and it's obviously paid off for you. Just quickly, um, the haul truck boxes. I want to jump into some partnership and stuff. But how how big are they going to make haul truck boxes? <laughs> is it just going to keep getting bigger? I mean, is like what what's the biggest one you've manufactured? recently the biggest truck we manufacture here is the 795 which is a 350 ton capacity truck happens to be caterpillar the most recent one that uh, that left our facility headed up to kirkland lake gold who is one of our partners and i'll let jamie expand on that uh, before uh, before too long but uh, um, if it wasn't for the 70 ton crane we would not uh, we've not would not have been able to fulfill uh, that need and uh, with over 2,000 man hours uh, put into those projects it, projects it's very significant it's a secure employment for both ourselves and within the region and uh, having partners like uh, Crook and Lake Gold that uh, are big believers also in, in shopping local uh, certainly helps and allows us to further invest uh, in the company. And that's being a, been a big part of our go forward plan has been to continually reinvest uh, into the company and, and further develop uh, the products and, and, and our overall offerings. I saw just one quick technical question. I saw it. I think it was a big, uh, I think it was a green one, uh, a big truck box and it had the side cut off. Um, was, I don't know if that was cut in half or a third was off or just the one sidewall. Is that a weight thing or is that a uh, width thing for getting hauled? It, it would be actually a combination of, of both, Jared. Um, that particular piece that you're referring to was 24 foot six wide, weighed about 70,000 pounds, and uh, was uh, happened to be headed up to uh, Kirkland Lake Gold at the detour facility. And um, it was a two third section. It's the first time that anybody in the region here has transported a 795 in a two third section to the property. And uh, which quickly ties into our super lo super load corridors, and that also something that I believe Jamie's going to touch on here in a little bit. But it's uh, it's allowed us to uh, be uh, unique in a very competitive environment, and uh, we're very proud of that uh, that box making its way to site without issue. Special floats allowing us to pick the box up and cross Bailey bridges at uh, five different water crossings uh, between Timmins and the mining property, which is about a two and a half hour. Uh, transit uh, from our facility here in Timmins. It was a very cool video. I uh, I swear that bridge was flexing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. Um, Jamie, let's talk about partnerships. I mean, it's uh, the 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 ecosystem that the bucket shop is putting together. Again, I mean, it's it's you know there are Canadian companies that do it, of course, um, but we just we see that aggressiveness a lot of the times. Um, especially coming from the U.S., so it just for me, it's just personally exciting to see, you know, what the and it and Paul, you touched on something you now that when they expanded, there was three times um, that it wasn't they wanted to do it and it wasn't the right time. So it's not just aggressive; it's also strategic, um, which to me makes it even more interesting. Can you talk about just putting that sort of ecosystem model together? Yeah, certainly. And you described it very well. It's a combination of calculated risk, balanced with aggression, balanced with timing, but overall it fits a strategic mandate. Um, if I were to put an umbrella around our, our business activities, it, it follows the themes of either evolution, transformation, and people. And just to sort of set the stage on where we came from, we've always been a very formidable company in the mining sector. And our business model was that typical business to business supplier engaged model where we would fix products or build products as, as the supplier and provide it to an end client, usually the mine site. 
Um, so that direct direct supplier model has now morphed into something that's a lot bigger. One example of where that grew, our distribution channel now, with our success, we have the ability to build buckets and boxes for any manufacturer. Mm. And we became so successful at doing it that that garnered the attention of a few major manufacturers. So we actually had major manufacturers approach us to say, listen, you're doing so well in the territory. There has to be some way for us to work together. So our distribution model went from supplier to client, from original equipment manufacturer, we're in the middle and now we feed the client. So that was sort of version one of how the business model enhanced. Version two on the strategic side, when we started to bring in more partners in that ecosystem, it allowed us to lean on our major suppliers, such as the steel partners. It allowed us to partner with the educational sector to bring in different training initiatives. It allowed us to talk to the government sector as we expanded our business. The government became very intrigued about our business model and the potential support that goes along with that. And then finally, by partnering with the end client and bringing value to them, as an example, to go back on our conversation, a typical supplier might build something, put a price tag on it and provide it to the customer transaction over. While our model is we want to see how well that piece of product works in your environment. So we're literally invested in auditing the results. We'll go underground or we'll go on site. And we'll, if we tell you that something's going to last for 2000 hours, we'll measure it for you and we'll tell you how well we're doing. And if we're on track, you'll know it. If we're off track, you'll also know it. And we can recalibrate us accordingly. Just going back in the conversation briefly, one of the, the luxuries that we have, because we help design our own products directly with a foundry, if we need an engineering change or we need a metallurgy composition change, we have that ability to do that. And that sets us apart because we totally own that product line and everything that goes into it. So we can take, take all that analysis and then help do a predictable expense forecast that we could, for instance, tell an underground client that in the next three years, you will need to swap out 27 buckets at this frequency, and here's how much it's going to cost over that time frame. And that's a service that we'll own. That whole maintenance and management of a fleet, we bring that value to the customer. And then the mine, the mines, their primary job is to get rock out of the ground. Our job is to fix the equipment and, and help take care of it. So we've, we've built a, a really good division of accountability that we can bring to the table that builds value instead of simply providing something with a price on it. I'm always curious when, you know, a company like yours, when you're starting to develop that service, is that, is that a meeting that, uh, you know, somebody at the table says, this is, this is something that the industry needs, so we should develop it? Does it, does it happen organically? Like you kind of are already doing it, but now you kind of want to make it more of an official service. How does that uh, sort of evolve? Well, that Paul will have a longer history on this than, than I will, but it started a few years back when it, it was on a wish list. And we everybody around the table kind of wished we had a better forecast and a better understanding of potential costs and the maintenance routines that the mines are going under. Because we we would get a call on a panic basis, basis oh my gosh, uh, our bucket's out of commission, it needs repair, come and get it now. So there was a, it was a very reactionary kind of process. And it, while it worked, it missed the planning and the strategy that went along with it and missed the ability to forecast how much money will they spend on their buckets, as an example, and could we save them money if we did it in a better fashion? So we decided to go first. We put the model in front of a couple of strategic clients that we deal with. It was very well received, and that's now become our boilerplate template that we'll provide all of our mining partners to suggest that, you know, allow us to take over that administrative role and we'll give it to your planners uh, at our cost and allow them to do the forecasting and, and uh, maintenance routines from there. What about as an OEM? Um, that is that you mentioned that the company started to come to you. Was that part of a plan or was that one of those organic things that you you were just building up your facility and then people start approaching you? Yeah, it started out organically, but our reputation preceded us uh, when we built our own brand of bucket with all the associated wear products that it was outperforming the original equipment manufacturer's components by such a wide de degree that they took interest. Uh, so much so that some of our customers would order an underground scoop tram with no bucket and they would come to us to add the bucket on. So we were, we were providing very ruggedized equipment that was lasting longer and provided better value. So clearly that captures the attention of big companies um, and we chose to approach opportunities together instead of against each other. 
I want to read a quote um, that that you provided, um, and I, I saw it reviewed, and and I actually I'm it's a little it's not too long, so I'm going to quickly read it, and then I'm going to follow up with uh, with a question, um, and and it's just from uh, this is from uh, Tony McCuck, the president and CEO of Kirkland Lake Gold, I believe, uh, the Kirkland Lake Gold Macasa mine is a flagship underground operation for us. A key mandate for the site is to provide a safe and productive workplace. And a main component of this is achieved by improved effectiveness through less equipment downtime and less modifications to the daily workflow. With this contract award, we are confident that the bucket shop will positively support that mandate. Now, there's a reason I love that. I love that review is because it's not, they treated us well, they did this and I I've seen the professionalism. So I know that's like a given that you did that. Um, but there are companies that, that rave about their customer service, but this review is very like, no, they helped our bottom line. And, and that's what I look for when I see really strong views. Are you, when you're dealing with your partners and is it, it, is it part of, is it a conscious choice or is it just organically that your company sort of cuts through the fat and you're, you're very technical and you're looking for the solution? Is that, is that part of the conversation that happens, you know, within the company? It, it, Paul's definitely in a better position to answer that. He's nurtured these accounts for years and uh, can give a, a, probably a more detailed history of the approach there. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Paul. To to to, uh, to answer the question best I can, Jared. I mean, we've been doing business now with uh, Tony McCooch and, and Kirkland Lake Gold uh, since 2011. Um, we've uh, we've enjoyed working together. Uh, our mandate was to uh, lower the frequency of change out, increase uptime at the face, and uh, provide user friendly systems and commonality where we could within the within the fleet. So uh, we, in the beginning of the show, we quickly touched on the two-piece bucket technology, and that is uh, such a large piece of our business today. Uh, the two-piece bucket technology is, uh, I believe there's some pictures that we have shared where the front end comes apart from the rear end. Uh, in the old days, prior to the two-piece technology, when a bucket was captive underground, it would have to be cut apart in order to come to surface, in order to be overhauled. And it would have to go back down underground in two components and then be welded back together and then put back into surface. Service. And that was a uh, primary design that was uh, centered around captive operations that did not have ramp access to surface. Um, today, uh, end users uh, are realizing that the two-piece technology um, is, is, go is good for both operations, both captive and non-captive operations. Um, so the rear end is kept in service now for, uh, um, for three times longer um, than, it, than it historically used to be. We introduced this technology to, uh, to Kirkland Lake Gold uh, at the Macassa mine in Kirkland Lake as one of uh, the first properties. And that allowed us to continue to propel ourselves forward, bring that value, um, increase that time at the face and have that scoop operating uh, longer without the emergency downtime. Uh, the predictability of uh, some of the uh, things that Jimmy had touched on earlier that is very real for us in being able to actually calculate when that front end needs to be changed out. And uh, most mines, uh, it's emergency downtime. It's, it's uh, not really managed all that well. Some properties do better than others, uh, but we're here to further enhance that offering. And Kirkland Lake Gold was a real stepping stone for us back in 2011. And um, they were quick to realize the benefits of the technology that we were bringing forward forward. And uh, uh, Tony specifically uh, uh, references the, the Bucket Shop's uh, successful three-year award uh, for uh, the Buckets at Macasa. And it's something we're very proud of. It's, uh, it's more than just a, a partnership. It's something I take very personally. I've been working that account since 2011. I've got a vested wow. interest in making sure um, that we're successful there, that we continue to meet the KPIs that we have set forth in, in, in the contract and the continuous improvement program is something that just never stops. Um, first off, apologies, uh, Tony, for saying your last name wrong. But um, the I wanted. I'm curious. There is a when an operating mine, and I go back to that quote, just that just sort of that that very cut through the fat type quote that he that he's provided. Um, where is that line, Paul, that you have to, to straddle between making sure you're offering the best value, 
but also not um, reinventing the wheel beyond what they're sort of capable of, of taking in right now. I don't know if I'm asking that question uh, correctly, but there's just sort of that, oh, we've got a new product, it's a new development, or with a, with a strategic and close partnership like that, are you developing based on what the feedback you get from them or are you bringing them ideas as well? Well, I think it is, it's a fine line. And I think it's very easy in today's mining environment to throw too much spaghetti at yeah. the wall at once. And uh, so we choose to uh, release it in a controlled fashion, provide the data. Uh, I think uh, today uh, a lot of people are, are quick to digest the numbers. If we can show them hard evidence and data that what we are doing is working, um, then, then, we're, then the ideas that we bring forward uh, tend to be embraced quicker. And, but it's just it's so important that we continue Continue to be innovative, and uh, we've always said here, uh, you know, amongst uh, the team and my family in particular, if you're uh, if you're not moving forward and somebody else is, they, we just must be driving these solutions forward all the time and and uh, uh, bringing them, uh, you know, to a new elevation. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's genuinely amazing what you've done, and and now going to a, a high level of partnership, uh, Jamie. Now you, the Bucket Shop's a private company. Um, you know, there's a th thousands of people watch the show. I'm not going to ask you what the numbers are and all that kind of crazy stuff, but there's been a, a partnership with the government, and and I think there is a lot of companies that don't understand how to approach government. They don't even understand what their value add is, and it's it's an over. I mean, you see one of those uh, things that you have to fill out as <laughs> you start working with government, and that's that's the end of it for a lot of companies. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, if, if nothing else, from an educational standpoint to uh, from some of our listeners? Sure. Uh, you described it well. So, so government clearly at all three levels, any prospering business, whether you're in the mining sector or not, um, it pays off to get them on your side. And whether that's just public endorsement or whether that's through funding opportunities. And I think where we're going here is just talk a little bit about the funding opportunities that the bucket shop's been able to take advantage of. So... First of all, credit to the Woodward family. They took the financial risks first and all the way leading up to the brand new facility, they invested millions of dollars of their own money without that government support. And the fact that they took that initiative, first of all, is a positive sign in the eyes of government. We, we clearly have a private company that understands the industry, has set deep roots, in this case, it's in Timmins, and is willing to, to grow their business in support of the strategic sector, the mining sector. So right away, we'd had captured the interest of the, of the mining sector. Uh, I've been here for about three and a half years now. And part of my role was to prosper those relationships and work those processes for potential financial support. And when you approach a provincial or federal agency that may, uh, may grant government support, um, there's a, an extreme vetting process that takes place. So they scrutinize taxpayer dollars as they should because they are literally taking the public's money and investing in a private sector entity. And that private sector entity has to have a proven past, a uh, prosperous future, uh, and a business plan that makes sense based on the industry that you reside in. So it's, it's not quick and easy money. It is a process to go through. And we had to be audited and vetted. Uh, uh, we had to be scrutinized financially. It is a long process. So, and there's no getting around the fact that you need proof of your past. And the business plan has to be sound and has to have, you know, credence behind it. It's founded on growth. It's founded on job opportunities and it's founded on economic value. So, there, oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, just saying that uh, once once that's presented and you get past the, usually the second stage of these these vetting processes, then it becomes much easier. So if if the government feels that, yes, here's a credible opportunity, we want to support your business expansion. And there'll be a percentage depending on the type of expense. And I'll use an example as a capital outlay. The government might provide up to 20% of the cost to support that capital outlay. Right. Sorry, Jared, you were going to say? Well, I was actually just curious. And I, I think you touched on something that's so important is to not confuse uh, partnership with the government with, uh, <laughs> hey, we'd like to do this. There's, the government's not, they're, they're not writing a, a check. <laughs> There's a lot of process and you need to be willing to step up. Um, but I, when I was curious, when you're going through that process, though, when you have that sort of scrutiny, especially as a, as a private company, you know, as opposed to public where you need to disclose a lot of information, so you kind of get into that, that mode anyway. But as a private company, was, 
did it actually in, in some ways improve your processes and seeing, okay, this is, we need to shore these things up and we need to have these processes in place and this clearly laid out. Did it sort of refine the company? That's a very intuitive point. So yeah, one thing it allowed us to do was look at our business overall and optimize the business either from technology that we needed to fill in some gaps or processes that need to be evolved to adhere to the highest of quality control standards. And because that is a form of improvement and you know, using the example again, that if we started to do work for an original equipment manufacturer, the quality control standards that they would impart upon us right. required us to have the people, the tools, the technology, and the processes to, to adhere to their standards. And, and that's, again, a checkbox that the government would look at as a, as a bona fide opportunity. Um, I'll give you a couple of other examples that, you know, business growth and expansion in the current times is a very positive check for the governments to look at. Another key area is that if we were willing to invest in that ca captured the attention of the government was our Indigenous partnerships. And uh, I'll, I'll say it and then we can pause and we can uh, flush out the question a little But We, because we operate in the mining sector and most mines in our case in Northern Ontario reside on First Nations uh, uh, properties, uh, it's imperative to have partnerships with those First Nations groups and support them as best you can through either economic sharing or employment opportunities. Well, we took it a step further and developed training initiatives that would complement the First Nations groups and support the mining activity at the impact benefit agreement level. So that's I'll stop there because that's a quick sentence with a long explanation of the build up to that. Yeah. But it's another another area that the government looks at as a company that operates holistically. Mm -hmm. And what's the value you bring to a community business expansion, strategic sector, Aboriginal partnerships, uh, supporting underrepresented groups. So there's a number of areas that the government will look at. And the more areas that you have impact or influence, the more opportunity for potential financial support you have. You, you, uh, I know, I know the bucket shop does have, you, like you touched on it, the, the training programs, uh, for, for indigenous trades, essentially, um, yeah. that, that partnership, uh, how did that, how does that operate? Is that, do you, are you dealing directly with the bands for that training or do you just open up a program and then anybody from some of these nations that, uh, in your region, can it sort of apply for it? What's the, and, I, and I'm sure there'll be some people that'll be interested in it. So I'd like to highlight that. Sure. So the, this one operates, it, it's an Aboriginal program and they approached us and the program, um, leverages Aboriginal women exclusively right now and men and youth will follow, but that they place these women into the mining sector to give them exposure to a career potential career opportunity in multi, you know, multi environments. So they could be at a mine site driving a haul truck or working in the mill. So we've been approached as a mining supply and services company. And they asked us the question, is there anything you could do to expose these ladies to your environment? And, and the difficulty with exposing to our environment, we're a welding and fabrication shop, which depends on experienced, skilled trades. Right. So our response, and, and, and Paul had been really actually thinking about this for about five years. Our response was, it's hard to give them exposure unless we give them training first. So why don't we create a training environment that is immersed in the production environment so they're training and exposed at the same time and at the end of that training we could actually give them welding credentials no different than our welding uh, employees here today would be certified by the canadian welding bureau we could build a program that that gives these ladies exposure and credentials and welding tickets as they're called so that's how the conversation started and then I often take about an hour to describe where we are. I realize you don't have that much time, but uh, it's done tremendously well in the last 18 months. We've got, we have, I have a lot of part twos this year. So uh, <laughs> hopefully we can get you back on. Um, the the uh, super load corridor, uh, Jamie, I just want to chuck, uh, Paul, I want to jump over to his sec to talk a little bit about, uh, there's just some things that have come up, you know, just from a leadership perspective that I want to touch on um, before we wrap up. But the, uh, at the beginning of the show, you mentioned the super load corridor, and I'm actually not even sure what that is. Can you talk a little bit about that, Jamie? Oh, with pleasure. The, the, so I'll segue that the super load corridor um, is an outcome of our government partnership. And what it is, is 
again, Paul, Paul had a vision for the mining sector that we started to take part in, in repairing and building these huge haul truck boxes. And while we have a division called Steel Tech that can go out to the mine site and do that, that is not the best conditions to be repairing certain equipment, especially in Northern Ontario when it might be minus 40. So we have a production capacity here where we could actually fabricate new or re refurbish the entire haul truck box in, in controlled conditions. And the idea was once we've built it here, we then of course need to transport it to one of the major mine sites. And roughly speaking, if Timmins is the hub in three different directions is a major highway with access to those, those mine sites. Now there's a process in place today that if you're gonna haul a huge piece of equipment, you need escort vehicles, you need a special permit, and it takes some time to get through that whole process. Well, when we measured the potential activity in the next three years, we decided to work with our local chamber and our mayor to approach the provincial government to say, listen, in the next three years, here's the amount of um, hauling activity we anticipate. Could we look at a permitting process that expedites, expedites the whole situation and allows us to respond much quicker and haul these large haul trucks on these major highways to support the local mines? And our timing of the request was impeccable because our provincial premier was in the territory doing a ribbon cutting for one of the major mine sites. And our mayor took our letter, handed it to the premier. The premier the next day called the Minister of Transportation, who assigned a local represent representative. And within 24 hours, we had a phone call back uh, with a suggestion of how do we help expedite the problem? Uh, not even a problem. It's just a new idea. Um, that's literally how fast the process tip. We're wow. very, very fortunate. And because of that, when you see these videos where the, the large green truck box and we can haul over that bridge, mm -hmm. that's an outcome of the expedited process that literally went to our provincial premier, right through the ministry channels and right back to us. And they recognize that, and to use our mayor's term, he refers to them as corridors of commerce mm -hmm. because there literally is millions of dollars of activity going up and down these roads. And we're really proud to be a part of that. And we're really proud to have gotten a positive response from the provincial ministry. Yeah, I, I think we could probably do a couple more shows and uh, <laughs> have, still have plenty to unpack. Paul, I want to jump over to you. There's, there's something that stood out for me, and I touched on it already, that you went to expand your facility three times. Um, and then I think you said three, and then the fourth time you, you went ahead with it, or maybe the third time. Um, and, and then, and, and Jamie has mentioned a few times that you've, you've thought about something for four or five years. And, and I, there was, is a personal thing that reminded me, cause I, I grew up playing hockey and spent a lot of time in the penalty box. Um, my poor parents, um, because I would, you know, I'd get frustrated and I'd go charging in and then I got broken bones and the whole deal. So, and I was thinking about that is that your approach, it, it really didn't pay off. So over the years I've learned to be more strategic those, you know, thinking about something for five years, you know, choosing not to move a few times, you know, those are very strategic thinking, um, but always looking to move forward. And I think that's the key. Is that something that you consciously, like for me, I have had to develop that for you. Was that a conscious thing or, or did, is that something that you consciously, is that something you had or you consciously developed over the years? Well, at first, it gave us a lot of sit down with family and, and uh, we meet regularly uh, on these on these subjects. And it was looking at uh, the economy and what was happening. So they were definitely calculated decisions that maybe it's just not quite right. Uh, the timing. And um, it is very important when we're going to make a move from a 35,000 square foot facility into the 85,000 we're in today. We're going to spend 20 excess of 20 million dollars. Uh, getting to where we are today. Uh, certainly all the T's had to be crossed. The I's needed to be dotted. We needed to know that uh, uh, gold and and, uh, and and the resources within Timmins were solid. Um, we've seen uh, forestry kind of fall off here in Northern Ontario. And, and so we really needed to rely more on uh, strictly the mining community. But um, it appears that they were the right decisions to make at the time. And I think had we moved forward in, you know, phase one, two or three, when we were were considering the timing would not have been right. And we, in fact, might not be where we are today had we moved forward at those times. So um, I think everything has worked out uh, very well. We've had a lot of support from our partners, our local chamber, the city of Timmins, 
Um, and, and, and again, just cannot say enough about the people um, here within our organization. And Jamie's done a, a, an absolutely fantastic job at overseeing, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, playing a role in, with the Chamber of Commerce and the Superloads and, and our Indigenous women uh, in, in our training uh, atmospheres and in, in those environments. And uh, yeah, we're just uh, looking forward to the tomorrows and, and uh, where this may take us. And I, I think I think it's important to to touch on it again. Is that it's you know when you you mentioned like uh, you know the local comp, chamber of commerce showing lots of support, um, but if there's one thing I've I've learned is that you you get support. Um, you know sometimes you get help, but most of the time it's when you earn that support. And I'm and I and I think it's important for someone listening to the show, especially if they're trying to develop their own business. Um, what advice? What do you think your company does very well? And I, I think we've touched on it in different ways that gets that support. What, what's the diff, What's the difference besides someone next door that doesn't get that support? Well, I think certainly thinking outside of the box is uh, is important. We consider ourselves to be uh, out of the box thinkers. Uh, we want to be innovators. Uh, it, it's certainly, uh, I think you, you've raised a very good point that, uh, uh, we've, I think we've earned, uh, that support and, uh, Jamie's, uh, connections and his involvement, uh, and ties uh, to the local chamber have uh, certainly helped propel, uh, some of these new ideas, uh, forward. Um, we've got a proven track record of being successful and, uh, that, uh, I don't believe that that happened, uh, you know, by happen chance. I think a lot of it had to do with, uh, you know, calculated moves at the, at the right moment in time and uh, sticking to our core business. Also something that's very important is sticking to core business. Uh, there's been lots of opportunities and lots of those golden grapes that have been dangled in front of us over the years. And while uh, while some of them were interesting and enticing, uh, we're venturing into uncharted territory, uh, so to speak. And so uh, sticking with our core business has made us, I think, experts in what we do. And uh, we consider ourselves uh, to be fortunate where we are today. And I'm very proud as a family member. I'm, I'm happy to have been uh, uh, involved the way that I have been since uh, coming on board as a co-op student. It's been a, uh, a roller coaster. It's been exciting. And we're very passionate about what we do here. So, You know, when you said about that, it's funny, leading up to this episode, I was thinking because I, you know, different companies I've caught on, I was like, I could probably send you 10 people that would want to work with you. <laughs> you must get now as your profile gets larger and larger and even global, is there, do you find that there's a lot of interest and you have to really work at filtering out what, what is the best for that, for the company? Well, since we moved into the new facility, uh, you know, that we have a fairly large uh, social media presence and, and Jamie looks after that as well. Uh, that's uh, certainly allowed us to extend our reach, uh, you know, now shipping buckets uh, into Africa and Mexico uh, out of, out of Timmins. And 20 years ago, we would not have thought that that was possible. So the company has continued to, uh, to evolve in, 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 in that regard. And, uh, it's uh, who knows where we're going to be tomorrow, uh, what interesting opportunities might present themselves. So we need to be selective and we need to be uh, moving forward cautiously. And it's uh, calculated decisions at every move. I, I, I don't. Uh, there's, there's a lot of positive that we've covered in the show, um, but I, I, I think it's important to to that there, there are struggles um, over the years. You know, and maybe if there's a high, a few that sort of stand out, what is what has sort of been the biggest challenges of of developing a company like yours? Today, it's people. And while we're surrounded by great people uh, within the administrative side of our business and in the office, qualified tradespeople have become uh, fairly scarce. Uh, 10 years ago, we used to run a job ad and we'd have 100 resumes uh, come in and there'd be 50 worth uh, sitting down and having an interview with. Uh, today, we run the same job posts over the same geographic area and we're lucky if there's 10 and within those 10, we're lucky if there's one worth having in. It's been very, very challenging. And I think uh, those uh, these problems that we're seeing, we're certainly not alone. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, qualified people across uh, all spectrums of all trades uh, are, are having a tough time. And I think that that's been our biggest challenge. I would say that today it's, um, it's what limits us from taking those next steps. 
Um, so uh, uh, we've uh, the indigenous women in 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 the welding field. Uh, that's uh, that's helping us put uh, uh, new uh, qualified people on the floor. And uh, just as recently as last night, uh, Jamie and I received our uh, our two new Canadians. And so immigration has become the next uh, step for our company to uh, to succeed. And Jamie, would you like to touch on the immigration side of the business? Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, with pleasure. And I think just uh, sort of step back at the larger level, the labor challenge has really impacted every sector across the country. Um, mining in particular in Northern Ontario has been hit particularly hard. Uh, we have two strikes against us. We have an aging, retiring population and a declining population uh, with youth out migration. So our 10 year forecast of labor uh, is very bleak. We need more people. And at a national level, it's been proclaimed that uh, you know, former Prime Minister uh, Brian Mulroney is sitting on a task force and a think tank that's basically expressed they would like a population for Canada of 100 million people. So we know that labor is going to grow, labor requirements, and immigration is going to be one of the strategies that we need to fulfill that requirement. So we've stepped back and we really have a three-pronged approach when it comes to growing our labor. We, we have organic and internal uh, capacity as best we can, and, and we'll work the territory and see who else is out there. Our Aboriginal training program, uh, its core mandate is to bring more people into the skilled trades that happen to be of First Nation descent. And our third prong is immigration. So over a year ago, we started the process to bring in six uh, foreign workers to become permanent residents. And uh, at the, as we record this video, uh, the first two arrived just last night. And uh, after their quarantine, we'll be uh, ready for the shop floor in less than two weeks. So that's that concept of us doing things beyond ourselves. So trying to contribute to the labor challenge across the region is starting to create a profile for us as, as a company that's supporting community initiatives and creating these legacy projects that are designed to serve the industry, not just the bucket shop. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually for me, I, I think as a business owner, you know, myself, it's, it's, it's pretty overwhelming all these sort of, and, and just how you lay them out that strategy. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're, if either one of you are ever looking to just, uh, help out a small company as an advisory role, we will love to have you. <laughs> um, you count us in. <laughs> it's amazing what you're doing. It really is. Um, Paul, I'm going to give the last question to you. Um, We've talked, we've covered a lot of ground. I think, uh, especially some of the way that Jamie lays things out, I think there's a lot of areas we could go into. But at the end of the day, um, is there a moment for you that stood out, uh, that went, that that was a good decision, and it just, it, it just sort of br brought that joy of running a company uh, you know, to its height? Well, <laughs> there's a long list of... Yeah. Uh, things over my 27 years here with the bucket shop and uh, uh the one that that likely sticks out the most that uh, there's really two of them uh, the recent success of the uh the Kirkland Lake Gold Macassa contract uh, that was uh, that was a big feather in our cap uh, having had that business for uh basically since 2011 while not under contract you know we were entering into a competitive situation you know just recently and and so to have resecured that business um that was very rewarding for me personally because as i said earlier that was an account that i've uh, stayed very very close to uh, throughout but really the expansion in 2017 and getting into the new building here um uh, it's such a pleasure to take customers out onto the shop floor and see that reaction. And, and it's the same lip movements that come out of everybody. And we can't repeat those things on the show here, but yeah. it's just an, it's just an, an, an awe factor. And it's the wow factor that we get from, you know, bringing people out there and the expansion has brought about just new opportunities, uh, you know, for our company. And we used to knock on a lot of doors you yeah. know, we, you know, we were feet on the street all the time and the expansion and some of the recognition that we've got for the investment and the initiatives that we have on the go. Um, now people are, you know, knocking on our door and it, it's such a nice positive change. 
And it doesn't mean that business is easy. Business is anything but easy. Yeah, uh, yeah. We have our challenges like every other business, especially during, you know, these times that the world is, is, is dealing with. We're, we're, uh, we're certainly not immune to that. Um, but uh, the expansion and getting into this facility and seeing the commissioning of the paint booth and the, and, and the 20 other, uh, the 20,000 square feet that was put on since we expanded in 2015 or sorry, 17. Um, it, it's uh, one of the most rewarding times within, within my career. And certainly the launch of our own proprietary line of, of, of castings and some of those solutions that we're bringing forward. There was, there's been a lot of things happen here in the last, uh, I'm going to say 12 to 18 months that people said it just couldn't be done. And there's nothing that gets me fired up more than somebody telling me it can't be done. Um, you know, when you surround yourself with the, the, the right team and you have the right approach, uh, there's simply nothing that can't be done. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. We've certainly seen our fair share of challenges, uh, but we've certainly um, have uh, more successes under our belt than we do failures, but we are not a perfect company and we do slip and trip. And when we do, we just hope to be judged at how quickly we respond to the fact that we made a mistake and we'll always be there. So it's been a very rewarding career uh, for me personally. And, and I can only hope that my kids share an interest in the business. I'd love to see it stay in the family. And this has been just uh, fantastic to be part of your show, Jared. It's It's been a lot of fun and can't thank you enough for making that initial contact with us. Thank you both for coming on. I feel like anything I ask or add is going to take away from what you just said. So we are going to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you very much for the show. I love what your company is doing. It's 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 actually amazing for Canada. It's it's great to have you both on the show. And, and thank you for all the the uh, effort of, of putting this show together with us. Um, it, it, it really means a lot. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Jared. Exciting. Our sincere pleasure. Thank you. Okay. I, I could keep going with that interview, Gaudi, I'll be honest. Um, but uh, we, we got to wrap up at some point. <laughs> we do. <laughs> um, Gaudi, where can people, we're going to put lots of links to the bucket shop. I mean, if you're watching this, you'll have already seen the links. Um, but where can people watch, follow, like, share, comment, and do all the things that they do with us? Well, definitely please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got two episodes a week on there. And um, so you don't miss a single episode. You can also contact us if you'd like to be part of the show or would like to recommend someone. Uh, info at crownsman.com. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jamie and Paul, for being on the show. Loved having you. Um, the Bucket Shop is a great company. Um and I hope everybody enjoyed the show. Please keep watching. Thank you for all the support. Check out CIM May 3rd to 6th. And check out miningformiracles.ca. They are, everybody's trying to go virtual and working like crazy. Fortunately, we, <laughs> we we're kind of already virtual. So, yeah. we, but um, please show your support for the industry. A lot of people are working hard to, to keep us connected and keep things moving forward. So thank you to them. Talk to you on the next episode of Mining Now.